Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us during this session of the Global University Climate Forum. My name is Nivanti Karunaratna. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the Professional Schools Sustainability Fellow at Yale University's Office of Sustainability. I oversee graduate sustainability fellows at Yale's 12 professional schools, which include architecture, music, law, and several others. Today, I am honored to welcome students from across the globe to this session, Tax Tactics That Build Power and Scale for the Climate Movement. Before we dive in, I'd like to read our statement of respect and inclusion. The Global University Climate Forum brings students together to share ideas, learn, connect, and act on the global imperative of addressing climate change. These are the forum principles of respect and inclusion. Number one, be inclusive. Strive to ensure that all feel welcome and valued. This applies to our speakers and guests, as well as our student participants. Number two, be open. Consider ideas that challenge your beliefs. If we support and learn from one another in this diverse group, we each become stronger. Number three, listen honestly. The forum is a neutral and safe space for testing ideas and asking questions. Work to receive rather than react. And finally, act mindfully. Bring the values of respect, inclusiveness, and humility into your actions as a climate activist. In the spirit of respect, inclusiveness, and humility, the organizers of the Global University Climate Forum acknowledge that in many cases, today's society is built on a foundation of oppression. Whether it has been through forced occupancy of land or through the subjugation of people, there currently exists the deep and seemingly incurable injustices throughout the world. The organizers of the forum ask that all participants consider their role in advancing a new future and putting us on a pathway to right these wrongs. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our brilliant speaker, Karina Barnett Loro, Deputy Director of the Climate Advocacy Lab. Her work with the lab involves managing their programmatic offerings, including both webinars and in-person workshops. She has spent the past decade organizing and supporting state-level climate and energy campaigns. As the session goes on, please use the Q&A function so I can pass your questions on to our speaker. Karina, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get that set up. All right. Is it looking good on, make sure, I wanna make sure it's looking good on your end. Okay, perfect. Um, well, welcome everyone. It's afternoon here. So afternoon y'all, I'm uh, in Durham, North Carolina in the US about four hours south of Washington DC. It's exciting to see um, such an international group of folks um, at the Climate Advocacy Lab. We work a lot on US issues. Um, so I'm gonna, be primarily presenting from that perspective, but really excited to hear from y'all in the comments and hopefully during the Q&A session, um, how some of the work that we're putting forward here in the US um, resonates and is being replicated uh, across the world. And just really excited and honored uh, to be speaking with you today. It seems like folks are coming from a very uh, diverse uh, set of backgrounds in terms of what you're studying, as well as, of course, um, a really incredible set of uh, countries and cities where you're living. So before uh, we dive into the specifics around tactics, um, I wanted to give a quick overview of the organization where I work, uh, the Climate Advocacy Lab. I imagine that most folks aren't familiar with the lab, but our mission is to help the climate community build grassroots power and win through evidence-based advocacy. And we do that uh, through supporting a member-based network of over 3,000 advocates, organizers, social scientists, data analysts, funders, and consultants, uh, again, primarily based in the U.S., although we do have uh, members around the world. And we do um, a lot of the work that I manage is our training program, so really focusing on helping advocacy organizations with their campaign planning and their communication strategy, developing organizing programs, um, and thinking about how folks are moving forward uh, campaigns both online and offline. Uh, we infuse our trainings uh, with what we call evidence-based insights, so drawing on social science research, political science, psychology, behavioral science, um, as well as data and analytics, thinking about um, how we can use data to both inform the work that we're doing and also evaluate what's working. Um, and then also by developing a really robust set of case studies 
um, looking at campaigns that have been run across the country and trying to figure out uh, how we can be employing more of the strategies that are working um, and maybe not as much the strategies that aren't working. And lastly, we make all of our trainings, research, and other tools and other resources uh, available for free to climate advocates across the US and, as I mentioned, around the world uh, via, our on via our online platform at the Climate Advocacy Lab. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in becoming a lab member, it is, again, like I said, open to everyone. Feel free to reach out to me or send a message uh, to info at climateadvocacylab.org. So when we at the Climate Advocacy Lab train advocates on campaign planning, we often talk about the building blocks of an evidence-based campaign plan. Um, how that works start with, starts with clarifying the vision for the world that we're working to bring into being um, and ends with a rigorous evaluation of our campaign to understand what worked well and what didn't. Um, but today, we're going to focus on how we pick tactics uh, that build power and scale, uh, which is a really critical building block and one that I think is uh, part of the campaign planning, uh, planning and implementation, implementation process that allows for like a lot of creativity and imagination. So before we jump into tactics, uh, I want to make sure we're operating with a shared definition of power. Um, power is certainly something that different folks uh, define in different ways based on where you're coming from. So I'll give uh, the lab's definition of power, which is a dynamic relationship between movements. So in this case, we're thinking about the climate movement and their targets resulting in the ability to achieve and sustain a collectively agreed upon goal. And the sustain piece is important, um, I think, because too often in the advocacy world, uh, we equate policy wins with power. Um, so only, in, and if we do that, then it's possible that we can win a piece of legislation or have our, the administration put forward a new regulation um, that's only, that gets rolled back uh, when a new administration comes into power. In the US, we obviously saw this a lot over the last four years, um, looking forward, fingers crossed, <laughs> um, to reversing some of that over the next four. Um, but when we're thinking about social movements and the climate movement in, in particular, uh, we know that we've built durable political power if we're able to sustain rules and regulations through the ups and downs and whims of different administrations. Um, finally, too often we make the assumption that activism um, or the actions that we're generating becomes power at scale. So in other words, we assume that more, more action taking, more resources, more people um, is always more effective in our advocacy work. Uh, but interestingly, what we found in social movement literature, and that's where I spend a lot of my time uh, thinking and reading, is that we don't build power and win just by generating more actions. We have to be generating more of the right kinds of actions. So what are the right kinds of actions? Or how do we know if the tactics that we choose are helping to build that durable power that we need to win and sustain our wins? Uh, Zainab Tufechi, who's a social scientist um, living here in the US, actually also here in North Carolina, who writes about protest movements, um, offers one framework that I think is really helpful for thinking about this. Um, her research and analysis suggests that the strength of effective social movements lies in their capacity, um, first to set the narrative, uh, to disrupt the status quo, and to, elect, uh, to affect electoral or institutional changes. And through building those capacities, our movements single, signal the credibility of our threat to decision makers and thus signaling our power. So if we're building across these capacities, um, we're building our power vis-a-vis -vis, um, the targets that we talked about in that original definition. So I wanted to dig into each of uh, these capacities a bit more with a few examples, um, maybe some that folks are familiar with, um, but maybe some that are new too. So when we talk about narrative capacity, we're really talking about the ability of a movement to frame the story of its own work and have uh, that framing, uh, the language that they use, the messaging be reflected in both the media coverage in the work as well as the public's general understanding of the work that's happening. So one really powerful example of this is the indigenous-led coalition that fought the Dakota Access Pipeline here in the United States. Um, they built very strong media capacity in that most of the media coverage um, of their work focused on the role of tribal community as water protectors and really amplified the message that water is life that was repeated and reflected um, across the US and around the world as people were taking uh, action in solidarity um, with the 
Standing Rock Sioux. And then when we think about disruptive capacity, it's, our, it's a movement's ability to interrupt what we call business as usual. Um, it helps us to get, it's when we're getting attention, making a point, um, or really making it untenable for people in power to continue as they have in the past. And then again, that we're able to sustain that disruption over time. Um, disruptive actions are important because they signal the depth of a movement's commitment to a cause and uh, thus kind of the, the credibility um, of us as organizations or campaigns to deliver uh, on the promises that we're making um, and you know, maybe some of the, the threats that we're making to politicians who aren't, uh, who aren't aligning with our goals. Um, one example that I think was uh, has really interesting here, again, here in the US, um, was the aerial blockade of Shell's Arctic bound icebreaker in Portland, Oregon. And maybe some folks uh, saw this action. It was a few years ago. Um, but Green Greenpeace act activists um, actually physically blocked uh, Shell Oil's icebreaking ship from leaving the harbor uh, by uh, hanging from one of the main bridges in Portland um, for almost a week. And what really that did was both physically block uh, the ship from getting to where it needed to be, but also as a result of the action, public pressure uh, mounted on Shell to abandon um, their Arctic drilling expedition. And actually just a few months later, uh, the company did announce that they were stopping their search for oil in the Alaska, Alaska, Alaskan Arctic, sorry, which has marked a major milestone um, in the ongoing keep it in the ground um, fight to end fossil fuel ext extraction. And then the last bucket that we're talking about is electoral or institutional capacity, um, which is our ability to affect a politician's electability or force institutional changes, um, such as at a corporation, or I think of much relevance to a lot of y'all at a university. Um, so when we're thinking about it in an electoral sense, um, if a politician gives us what we want, then we support them. And if we don't, then they get voted out of office. The Sunrise Movement's work uh, here in the US, and I know that there's uh, great youth activism and advocacy happening around the world, uh, is a good example of a movement building both electoral and institutional capacity. So here in the US, the Sunrise Movement has helped elect key climate champions, um, such as Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, as well as staged a lot of actions and put a lot of pressure on the Democratic Party here in the US uh, to be bold, more bold um, and take uh, more progressive stances on climate policies. Um, so I'm gonna stop there for a second. And I think you've got a couple of poll questions that I'm just interested uh, to hear from all of the participants. So if you can um, launch the first poll, I'm really curious to hear from y'all when you're thinking about uh, these three different capacities, narrative capacity, disruptive and electoral or institutional capacity, uh, where do you think the climate movement has the most strength right now? I'll say that we ask this question a lot in uh, trainings that we do um, here in the US and it's yeah I'm really curious to hear um, how folks might be thinking about this question differently uh, in the US versus globally. Um, great so I'm seeing the results right now it looks like about half um, half of folks think that we have uh, the most narrative capacity a quarter disruptive um, and then, yeah, 10% electoral, that's really interesting, and 21% and institutional. Um, I would say that in the U.S., uh, when folks ask that, that question, or when we ask that question to folks, um, electoral capacity is one of the highest um, that people say, I think in part just because of the way that elections are run in the U.S. and the way that kind of politics operates. Um, but it's really interesting to see kind of the, see the differences uh, between different countries. Um, and then the second question that we had uh, that I had teed up for folks was really about your organization. So if you're thinking about 
um, your organization, not necessarily the movement as, as a whole. Um, where do you think you've built the most capacity? Um, maybe this is the campaign that you're running at your school, or maybe this is a campaign that you're running um, in your community or a global campaign that you're working on. Cool. So yeah, interestingly, it looks like um, there was a big jump in institutional capacity, which I think makes sense, obviously, if a lot of folks are, um, yeah, are working at a university level, or uh, maybe within your community working on a corporate campaign. Um, thanks so much for sharing, y'all. It's really helpful to just hear where folks have additional experience and thoughts. Um, and if you have great examples kind of throughout the presentation, of, uh, of tactics that you've been using uh, to build capacity across or to build strength across these different capacities. Um, I'd really be excited to hear them. Maybe I can include them in a future presentation. Um, so movements are most effective when, as you might imagine, when they're building strength across all of these capacities, when they're thinking about shifting narrative, disrupting the status quo, and demonstrating credible threats to the electability of key targets. Um, so when we're thinking about the suite of tactics we want to invest in as an organization, we should be thinking about how each tactic is going to help us reach our campaign goal, obviously, because that power that we're thinking about is, is, that, is the relationship based on our ability to, uh, to achieve and sustain a goal. Uh, we're thinking through how it helps us strengthen narrative, disruptive, or electoral and institutional capacity. Uh, we're thinking about how it helps us build alliances and potentially neutralize our opponents. Uh, one of the best things about doing this work as part of a movement or coalition is that different organizations bring different skill sets and strengths and can focus on building different key capacities. Um, and then how does it align with values of justice, equity, and inclusion? Um, are the tactics that we're picking accessible? Um, are we picking kind of goals on our campaigns that are furthering um, justice and equity in the world, uh, really thinking about how the tactics that we're picking align with the values that uh, we've laid out uh, as an organization or as a campaign. Um, and then can we replicate this tactic at scale? Um, our, often our ability to move tactics forward, especially if it's a big, if it's tactic like a protest or something that involves a lot of people, is dependent on our ability to motivate folks to take action, um, keep them engaged, and then supporting leadership development. So we're always going to be thinking about how we're building organizations and campaigns that people want to be a part of. And finally, in COVID times, uh, we're thinking about health and safety and how are we picking um, tactics that are powerful but don't pose unnecessary risk to ourselves and others. Um, so maybe that's thinking about how some of these tactics might translate in a digital context. Okay, so jumping into some examples. Uh, one of my favorite examples uh, from the US last summer uh, was the class of 000 campaign. Um, and this was an effort led by a number of organizations to recruit high school and college seniors who were giving speeches at their graduation ceremonies uh, to donate 30 seconds of their speech to talk about the climate crisis and urgency of action. And this led to hundreds of students across the country talking about climate change um, to friends, uh, to uh, family members, uh, to other folks in their school, uh, which was a communication strategy made even more powerful <coughs> Um, by the moral clarity of the message that really leveraged young people's status as trusted messengers on the climate crisis. Uh, research by social scientists has actually found um, that uh, students, that has like uh, validated this, um, that the parents of students who receive instruction on climate change uh, end up becoming more aware and more concerned about climate change themselves, uh, theoretically, because students come home, they talk to their family about climate change, what they're learning at school, 
And interestingly, that the shift was most significant um, for conservative fathers um, whose daughters were in, were in class um, where they were being taught about climate change. And so the graduation tactic uh, builds, again, both this narrative capacity as more and more students have the opportunity to share how climate change impacts them, as well as disruptive capacity, given this sort of element of surprise in inserting a call to action uh, within the context of, uh, you know, kind of the traditional graduation speech format. And then finally, the graduation speech tradition, at least here in the US, um, gives organizers really thousands, um, tens of thousands of built-in opportunities every year um, to scale the number of students participating in the action, as well as to amplify uh, those stories via social media. So just a cool example of a tactic um, that was helping, that helped the youth climate movement build both narrative and disruptive capacity. Uh, one that maybe is something that y'all have used in your campaigns, but a really impactful campaign that was run here uh, in actually the state that's right below the state where I live in South Carolina. A coalition of organizations uh, used film screenings of the documentary Chasing Coral, um, which is a film about climate change and climate change's impact on coral reefs as a mechanism for bringing um, together hundreds of people across the state to talk about climate change and build support for a policy um, that would reduce barriers to solar energy in this state. And they found that if these film screenings were a fun tactic um, that could be deployed relatively easily um, in key cities and legislative districts that they needed to win the statewide policy. Um, at the film screening, organizers uh, collected photo petitions and then um, you know, had conversations with lots of folks from the community, built this huge base of support for statewide clean energy legislation um, that they were then able to go back to those folks and activate them over the course of the campaign. Um, and in May of last year, the Energy Freedom Act was signed into law and um, the executive director of one of the organizations who worked on it had a, a quote that I thought was uh, really telling, you know, talking about how uh, the film program uh, increased the number of folks who were reaching out to legislators asking them to support this bill by 30 percent um, from what they've been able to do in previous years and really allowed them to take uh, their act their activism work to the next level. So thinking about um, both the power of vis-a-vis -vis, um, contacting legislators but also the scale in terms of being able uh, to activate thousands more people than they'd have been, than, than they'd been able to activate before. Um, another example uh, that I like comes from an, an organization, another organization that we work with at the lab, uh, Minnesota 350, um, where volunteers in the Twin Cities, so two big cities in Minnesota, Minneapolis and St. Paul, were launching a campaign on transit equity and wanted to make sure that they were picking a really strategic and inclusive goal. So they decided to launch a canvas, um, which in the US is traditionally a tactic where you go knock on people's doors and ask them kind of questions, or maybe you're asking them to go and vote um, in the election. But instead of going door to door, um, the organizers and volunteers rode buses all over the city, um, having thousands of conversations with transit riders that provided really valuable information about how community members were experiencing climate impacts and also what they wanted to see, sort of their vision for the transportation system in Minnesota. And one of the impacts that transit riders uh, kept bringing up was how fumes from diesel buses were aggravating uh, respiratory health issues. Um, so Minnesota 350 was able to leverage both the narrative capacity that they built through those thousands of conversations with transit ride riders and the institutional capacity they built um, by gathering petition signatures um, and having those transit riders contact uh, the Twin Cities Metro Transit Authority. And they leveraged that to run a successful campaign uh, which won zero emission buses uh, for this, the Twin Cities and was able to, again, kind of reduce, reduce that, those diesel fumes that had been impacting folks. Um, another example of a tactic that served uh, to build both narrative and electoral capacity um, comes from Kentucky, um, which is a more rural state in the US and is kind of famous for having um, had a lot of coal, coal mining and coal miners. Um, so a state where politically um, they are trying to combat uh, a narrative around um, coal being like a very critical form of, of energy and not one that we want to stop relying on. 
Um, so the organization Kentuckians for the Commonwealth launched what they called their powerhouse project and organized a series of free workshops for community members um, where they focused on how to reduce their energy, their electric bills and save energy, um, as well as benefit from existing solar and energy efficiency programs that were sponsored by their state's utility. And along with information about those programs, KFTC organizers distributed these energy efficiency kits uh, with items like LED light bulbs and weather strips to help to give some people something actionable that they could take home and do in their own homes. And they raised, um, they were able to uh, train over uh, nearly 150 community members in politically important counties across the state with each workshop um, really designed to meet the local needs um, of the folks from those communities. And in addition to building their activist space and volunteer leadership in key districts and getting messages out about energy efficiency and solar opportunities in Kentucky, um, they learned a lot about how people in those communities were experiencing climate change, what they thought about clean energy, and they were able to incorporate um, some of those messages and frames into their broader communication efforts including tapping into a lot of widespread anger about high utility bills um, that folks were experiencing, as well as support for large scale government reform that they didn't know existed before. And so again, building that kind of narrative capacity that allows them to be more effective communicators on climate and energy, as well as the electoral capacity in key districts. A uh, recent action uh, by the Center for Climate Disobedience um, in New England, I thought was a fun example of building both disruptive capacity and narrative capacity. Uh, so in August of last year, a team of activists uh, from across New England removed 500 pounds of coal from the Merrimack Generating Station in New Hampshire um, to launch the bucket by bucket, no coal, no gas campaign. Um, the Merrimack is actually the last big coal plant on New England's power grid. And while most energy analysts agree its operation is unnecessary, there are no plans as of yet to close it. So prior to the action, the campaign uh, teased this fun video of folks uh, in white hazmat, hazmat suits walking along a train track, uh, carrying empty buckets simply with the line, where are these buckets going? And an invitation to watch the action via Facebook Live the next day. So the removal of buckets of coal from the generating station was disruptive at a few different levels. Um, first with the physical removal of the coal. Um, and then also when the buckets of coal were dumped in front of the New Hampshire State House, uh, forcing policymakers to confront the impact of continued fossil fuel reliance on the state. And uh, the disruption was actually scaled via simultaneous actions in Vermont and Connecticut, which are two, uh, two neighboring states, and actually the, the other two states um, where power from the Merrimack coal plant um, is sent on the energy grid. So again, just kind of a cool example of um, how an organization combined um, both building narrative capacity through this narrative around um, no coal and no gas and also the disruptive capacity. All right, um, another example of disruptive capacity actually at a university um, was a sit-in stage last year by Harvard and Yale students um, during the football game between the two schools um, where students were calling for divestment from fossil fuels of the university's respective endowments. I don't know if y'all, the Yaleys on the call want to comment on this at all or if you remember it. Um, but it made, made big national news. Uh, activists poured onto the field uh, during a timeout, uh, disrupting the flow of the game. And one of the reasons, so again, kind of thinking about disrupt, disruptive tactics um, and building disruptive capacity. And this was a great tactic um, in part because the action had a really clear target in the university presidents and a clear call to action to divest their endowment from fossil fuels. And then had this interesting kind of narrative capacity element too, um, because of the juxtaposition of collaboration between the two, um, between the Harvard and Yale climate activists at a time when their, uh, their football teams were competing on the field. And then I think I like these types of actions uh, because they are both replicable and scalable. scalable. Um, college sports are huge in the US, high school sports too. There are um, thousands and thousands of opportunities uh, for students to engage in similar acts of, disobedience, of disruptive disobedience. 
Um, and it ended up having a bit of an impact in that it both drew national attention to the fossil fuel divestment movement and also forced conversations at both schools about their commitments to fossil fuel divestment. Another organization that um, I've really been excited about, particularly as we see worsening climate impacts across the US and around the world, um, is one called Communities Responding to Extreme Weather. Um, they're based in Massachusetts. And what they do is focus on uh, recruiting, training, and organizing local businesses, uh, nonprofit leaders, libraries, churches, and schools to provide assistance to community members before, during, and after extreme weather events. So setting up these kind of resilience hubs all around communities and all around the city. And um, they're, they're building narrative capacity through their work to lift up stories of local impacts um, by looking at kind of where there's flooding, um, where there's extreme heat during the summer, where people are experiencing, experiencing other types of climate impacts. Um, and also electoral capacity as they're strengthening sort of relationships and community cohesion at the hyper local level. So by bringing folks together, you know, at the library, at the local school, um, that's the place where people are actually voting um, during an election. You know, these are often literally the, the polling places here in the US. Um, so building that kind of electoral capacity in terms of um, strengthening, you know, building that story, so sorry, building narrative capacity through sort of the stories of climate impacts and then electoral capacity as they're bringing people together and building support for resilience policies. So if you're thinking about, if you're more focused on adaptation, um, I thought that this was a really uh, cool tactic that fits um, a few of those different buckets. Um, and then, yeah, another another one that I really love um, is the Solar XL project, um, which is a re renewable energy resistance tactic um, focused on building solar arrays directly in the root of the Keystone XL pipeline, um, which is a pretty famous pipeline that has been in the process of being built and uh, contested in the US for almost 10 years now. Um, and it's one example of an emerging tactical strategy called disruptive humanitarianism. And uh, what they mean by that is that solar panels are not only physically um, disrupting the pipeline's pathway through Nebraska and other parts of the central United States, but symbolically disrupting our continued reliance on fossil fuels uh, by putting clean energy solutions in the path of the problem and creating real benefits for the communities uh, where the solar energy is going. And it builds this narrative capacity for the movement by providing a counter narrative to um, the pro pipeline story that often pits jobs versus the environment. Um, and again, it's a tactic that's replicable across a variety of fossil fuel infrastructure fights, uh, which is exciting as we're thinking about, um, you know, what are the great ideas and effective strategies that we can take and try out in other places. So those are just a few examples of tactics that I've come across recently um, from Climate Advocacy Lab members and partners. Again, apology for, apologies for the US centrist, centrism um, of that presentation. It's just kind of where, where we're working at the Climate Advocacy Lab. Um, but I think for me, what excites me is just how endless the possibilities are um, for what we can harness, our creativity, um, our individual energy, our passion, our commitment. Um, it just, it's really cool um, for me in a movement support role uh, to be able to support activists and organizers, volunteers across the country. And then in my individual role as an activist in my community, um, thinking about how I can kind of pick the best of what's working in lots of places and, and try it out here um, in the campaigns that I'm working on. So just wanted to sum things up in a few top line takeaways before we head to the Q&A. Um, so yeah, as you're picking tactics for your campaign, again, always keep your goal and strategy top of mind. Um, I think our power building, you know, because our power building efforts are focused on achieving and sustaining that goal, um, we want to always be thinking, okay, what's our goal? Um, how are we picking tactics that are in service of that? Um, second, thinking about how our tactics are building power, are building strength across these key capacities. So narrative capacity. Um, through compelling stories that are told by a diversity of voices and impacted constituencies, um, disruptive capacity that interrupts business as usual, um, either physically, symbolically, or both. 
um, electoral capacity, you know, here in the US really focusing on key political opportunities and obviously the political system in everyone's country is, is different. Um, but I think there are often opportunities to be involved in the, to intervene in the electoral system. Um, and then institutional capacity by identifying the leverage points that we have within respective decision making processes, whether that's at a university that we're attending or businesses that we frequent or like when you graduate the place where you work. Um, and lastly, thinking about how toxic tactics can be replicated at scale and again during this current global pandemic uh, translated to digital platforms that help keep folks safe um, and stop the spread of COVID. So that's all that I have. Um, just going to throw my uh, name and email address up there. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm excited to hear, yeah, more of your questions and reflections. And um, if you have creative tactics that you've tried out on your campaigns, I would love to hear more about them. Um, I put my dog in here just in case he barked throughout the presentation, but he's actually been pretty good. So, um, and a list of, I didn't have all the citations ready for you, but I included a list of books that are ones that I draw on a lot uh, when I'm thinking about social, social movement theory um, and how to apply those insights to climate campaigns. I have to say before we get to the questions that your dog is absolutely adorable. <laughs> Um, but yeah, let's just jump straight into the Q&A. So our top question says, um, online campaigns have a lot of international reach these days, but the social media attention span seems to last a few days at max these days. How do you think we should develop our campaigns to be visible and relevant online, regardless of the whims of the current trends? That's a good, yeah, good question. And I feel like obviously, especially right now when so much of the organizing work that we're doing is online. Um, I think one of the things that we stress a lot in our digital organizing trainings um, is the importance of capturing people's uh, information so that you can be building relationships and sort of scaling the work that you're doing with them even after a specific action has been taken. And especially because platforms change so often and people are going on and off platforms. So if you have someone who's taking an action with you on Facebook or Instagram, um, reaching out with, to them to build that relationship so that you can continue to connect with them even after the action is over. Um, and I think one of the other things that we talk about as well is having um, leadership ladders for your digital organizing work in the same way that you might have it for your um, offline organizing work. So what are the more, um, yeah, just like more committed actions you might be asking people to take, uh, whether that's to monitor um, you know, comments on a Facebook post or whether that's to be doing like organizing work via Facebook Messenger or managing a peer-to-peer -peer texting program. Um, that's on the organizing side. And then I think on the sort of narrative capacity side, um, I don't, I don't, as, as someone who's not like a communication strategist or communications officer, I'm not someone who's ever been tasked with like making a tweet go viral or anything like that. So I don't feel like I have uh, tons of wisdom to offer in, in that regard. But I think that like one thing that we often advise people on is just not to, not to rely on that as like a cornerstone of your strategy because so often the situ, you know, the conditions under which like your campaign wins based on you know, us like a kind of like viral social media moment is pretty low. So you just want to make sure that like as you're bringing people in via social media, you're continuing to kind of capture that their information so you can follow up with them, that you're building relationships um, over online platforms in the same way that you might build relationships with people um, offline. And then, yeah, but I do think that there are tons of opportunities over social media to to build um, to build the narrative that you're trying to to get out there. And so, just test. I mean, a lot of what a lot of what we advise people to do at the Climate Advocacy Lab too is just to test stuff out, um, especially before you invest in like putting putting forward a big new project or program. Great, thank you for that. 
our next question asks, how can a movement avoid the public perception focusing disproportionately on its tactics, which condemns them as too radical or violent without actually listening to their claims? Another, <laughs> another good question. And I had to like, you know, pare, pare down what could have been like a, you know, five hour dissertation on social media theory. Like one of the um, one of the things that we talk about a lot is the tension between narrative capacity and disruptive capacity, because often um, when we're doing more disruptive direct actions, we don't necessarily control the narrative of how it's being um, portrayed in the media. Um, there is some interesting research to suggest um, the conditions under which direct actions and protests um, have the biggest effect on policymakers. Um, and so uh, one of those things is uh, no violence. Um, so I think that, you know, kind of stressing and, and training your volunteers in the principles of non of strategic nonviolent direct action. Um, the second is kind of unity of, you know, I, don't, I hate to use like Silicon Valley terms that brand like branding, like when everyone's wearing the same color, um, when there's sort of like continuity of, um, of posters, of messaging. I think the Sunrise Movement is an example of an organization that has uh, like a, a really, um, uh, a really strong brand in terms of like the black and yellow, I would say Extinction Rebellion um, in the UK and other parts of Europe, similarly, like always having the XR hourglass. Um, and then I think like one of the third things is that actually for our, for our disruptive actions, as with many of our actions, um, it's more impactful to do um, smaller actions and sustain them than to just do one big action. So we've actually seen that um, because that's a better proxy to how people might vote, to like demonstrating that you have kind of the capacity to impact how people are going to vote. Whereas if you're just driving people to one protest, um, it's like a depth, a depth of commitment to the movement that's, um, that doesn't translate as well to some of the, the ways in which politicians might view your protest. Mm -hmm. Our next question um, asks, what do you think about civil disobedience and related movements like the Extinction Rebellion? Is it efficient and how? <laughs> yeah, um, I think that actually direct action is a really key strategy. And I think that like, as we saw in most of the polls before, um, as a movement, we haven't spent as much time developing disruptive capacity as I think we might need to in order to ultimately be successful in achieving some of the goals that we put forward as our movement. Um, so I think, you know, for example, when we look at the civil rights movement here in the US or um, when we look at other like successful protest movements around the world, um, there was just kind of disruption, non nonviolence, civil disobedience, arrestable actions were, were a much bigger part um, of their strategy. And I think, I mean, I'll just, uh, speak for, um, I'll speak for myself. And then I think it's for a lot of people, it's scary um, to think about getting arrested for some people, especially if you're a person of color, the implications for being arrested are much, uh, are potentially much more serious um, than for me as a white, a white woman. And so, yeah, just thinking through um, the, like, who make, who, for whom does it make sense um, for just for like direct action um, to be a primary tactic that you're moving, that they're moving forward and for whom is there maybe a little bit more risk? Not to say that um, we might not all need to be risking um, that at some point, but I do think that disruptive capacity, at least when we look at social movements over time, is one of the, the really core things that I don't think we've taken as much of an opportunity to build out as the climate movement so far. Although I think we're seeing, seeing more of it and have seen it um, around a lot of the pipeline fights uh, in particular, Keystone, just Dakota Access, Line 3, which is um, in Michigan. So I don't, I have to say, I don't know as much. I know Extinction Rebellion has done some um, maybe more controversial disruptions and I, I just, but I personally haven't followed it quite as, as closely 
um, as I would need to to be able to comment on that specifically. Our next uh, question says, it seems like our politicians still don't listen to youth activists. If anything, they, they pay the climate crisis lip service without enacting any substantive policy. How do we translate social movements in disruptive and narrative capacities into electoral capacity? Yeah, so it's been fascinating um, just living, I think living through that in this past, uh, this past year in the US and watching um, the youth climate movement translate what I think has been a lot of narrative capacity over the last couple of years um, into electoral capacity in terms of a youth voter turnout being um, you know, the highest it's been in, in many, many years and especially in like key districts that were important for um, electing pro-climate leaders trying to say that in as C3 a way as possible. Um, but I think that, you know, when we, when we think about, I mean, so I think there are a few different things. So obviously, if you're not, if you're not old enough to vote, at some point, you'll be old enough to vote, at which point, you know, your narrative capacity naturally translates into um, your ability to cast a vote for people who are um, living up to the promises they've made on climate. Um, if you're not old enough to vote, I think, as I mentioned before, uh, we know that uh, youth are really powerful messengers um, on climate, especially to their parents. So um, if your parents are casting votes, making sure if, uh, friends of your parents, um, thinking about how you can leverage that, I think a lot of the politicians that, especially from conservative, the conservative party in the US, um, when we've seen them, when we've seen them come out on climate, um, the story they've said is that, you know, my daughter or my son or, um, you know, someone that I love said, what are you going to do about climate dad or what are you going to do about climate mom? And, and that's the story that they use um, to talk about their kind of personal transition to caring deeply about climate. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but I mean, I think the other, the other piece of it uh, is just to continue um, to continue to build the narrative, your narrative capacity, and potentially if you have the op if if it's available to you, disruptive capacity, um, until until you're able to exercise electoral work yourself. In the U.S., at least, you don't have to be 18 to register voters. You don't have to be 18 um, to be a poll worker. There are a lot of ways you can also engage in the electoral process, even if you can't cast a vote yourself. Mm -hmm. Kind of as an addendum to that past question. Um what do you find makes for effective messaging? Because, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom in the media these days. Do you find that that inspires more of a sense of urgency or a sense of defeat? Or do you find that, you know, more positive and uplifting messaging tends to work? You know, for example, you know, we, we talked about parents, you know, kind of being galvanized into motion when their children have conversation with them. Yeah, so we do a lot of like trainings on communicate kind of effective climate communications at the lab. And uh, we talk about a few different kind of effective core strategies. Um, so one being that you actually need to do a few, like you kind of need to hit on a few different points. So um, the fear-based messaging, um, the kind of urgency, it does motivate people to take action. Um, but you need to also have kind of pivot pretty quickly to like solutions um, and more hopeful messaging if you're going to sustain that action taking. Um, and then also this message that I think um, we've seen a lot of youth activists employ of the kind of moral courage that's necessary to take action um, and to take risks, even when you don't know uh, that things are going to be okay. Like I think a lot of us are in that space right now of like, I don't know that even if I take all these actions, things are, are going to be okay. And so, how we're um, how we're using language that also employ um, uh, employs like morals and courage uh, can be really important. Um, and then I think a little bit related to that, we talk a lot about the importance of um, language that uh, empowers people, efficacy language. Um, so emphasizing that people have the skill set they need to take action. Um, that their action is going to make a difference. So not playing into narratives that, you know, nothing will ever change. Politicians don't listen, even though it feels like that sometimes. Um, and then also that the solutions we're putting forward are actually meaningful and are going to address the problem 
Um, and then the third thing is just uh, the piece around social norms and the importance of understanding um, of people understanding that other people like them are really uh, concerned about climate change and are also taking action to address it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Our next question asks, what do you think about changing the system from the inside? So for example, cooperating with the leaders of universities or fossil fuel companies to encourage them to take climate action. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that at least what I've come to appreciate from like my advocacy and also what I've witnessed from you know, both reading social science literature and also seeing, um, you know, seeing a lot of reflections from folks across the lab is that again, I think it's not, it's really not an either or strategy. It's good to have people who are uh, pushing from the outside and also people who are at the negotiating table. Um, I think that when you, it's always better to go to the negotiating table um, with, when you've built up like a lot of power and credibility, I think a mistake that can be made is to like start comp start the compromise process too soon, um, and maybe the person that you're comp that you're trying to negotiate with doesn't actually feel uh, like you're as much of a credible threat, um, and therefore not willing to cede as much in the in the negotiations as if you waited a little bit longer before you started negotiating, um, but you know, it's such a, it's, it's so dependent on the situation. And sometimes there are like other timelines and actually like literal lives on the line uh, mm -hmm. that folks are needing to consider. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I am bombarding you with questions, but I'm, I'm aware that we only have about five minutes left. So I'm just trying to get through as many of these as possible. Our next question asks, what is the difference between a good and a bad activist? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I'm not sure if that's like a, if that's a, an effective versus ineffective activist or a more, like a more moral ju judgment. Um, I guess if we're, if we're asking about the latter, I mean, I think like if you're a, a like good activist, I think are, um, or I think of good as like, very, as being pretty strategic. Um, so I think it's easy, like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, to sort of jump straight to tactics um, without being thoughtful about, you know, really going through that sort of process of figuring out what we actually want to be achieving, what's our theory of change, um, doing the kind of process of power mapping our targets so we understand um, what the most effective avenues of influence for those targets um, are going to be, uh, thinking through sort of who we need from the constituent constituency perspective who we need to be activating and organizing in order to influence. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as if it's the latter, I don't know. I mean, it's sometimes I think there, one thing that I is hard about activism sometimes is that you do get some like lone wolf type people who, um, you know, go against uh, what folks have agreed upon is like a coalition or a campaign. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's not disrespectful. It's often counterproductive to the work that's happening. Um, so wanting to make sure that like the people who are there, um, that, you know, they're more about change than being in charge, I think is like a mantra that I'm hearing more lately, like, you know, not letting sort of turfiness and ego uh, get in the way of the kind of impact and, and transformation that we're working for. Mm -hmm. All right, we have about four minutes left. Our next question asks, how do we deal with incorrect information that gets shared on social media? Oof. <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> yeah, I, if I knew the answer to that question, I <laughs> would probably be, you know, employed in another uh, sector. I, so I, it, if you, um, I do have some resources around that. So whoever that is, if you want to reach out to me directly, I can send you some resources. I think uh, disinformation is actually one place where um, you can give uh, digital, like kind of digital volunteers and activists a more substantial role. Um, so we've seen, for example, like Greenpeace has a program called the Social Media Hive, where they have a cohort of digital activists who are just sort of like monitoring um, 
monitoring both opposition messaging and also organizational messaging and understanding like how people are interacting with it, deleting comments that are not true, um, you know, responding to comments on, you know, sort of the opposition's page uh, to make sure that like, at least if they're saying things that are wrong, someone's pushing back against it. Um, I think, you know, it is hard in this, yeah, in this age of like bots and massive disinformation campaigns um, to be able to do that maybe at the scale necessary to truly combat it. But um, again, I, if, if you want to reach out to me, whoever asked that question, I, I do have some specific like guidance and resources that I can share. Great. And I think we have time for just about one more question. This one, this question asks, how do we effectively advocate for climate action in less democratic societies? <laughs> Man, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I have a great answer to that question, mostly because, you know, for all the work that I've done has been at least in our, the pseudo democracy that is the US and um, and all of the work that we do at Climate Advocacy Lab. I would say that based on a lot of the research I've read and, and um, that one of the social scientists I mentioned, Zainab Tufechi, like a lot of the work that she did was actually um, studying Arab Spring, um, the Arab Spring and protest movements um, across a lot of the Middle East. And uh, what she saw from that was that the, it was even more important to have the disruptive capacity um, and the ability to kind of withstand oppressive, um, yeah, withstand the oppression that often comes with regimes that are not democratically elected. Um, and so I think that in, in that case, I mean, obviously there's risk, there's substantial risk involved with it too, but I think at least from, um, from a lot of the research that she's done, having that, having built out that sort of disruptive capacity in addition to um, the narrative capacity that allows you to maybe transcend uh, media block it, you know, sort of blocks in your own country and get your message out um, in an international context that may be able to pressure uh, a government in different way that both those things were really important. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for that. Um, so as we're wrapping up the session, maybe you can go ahead and pop your information either back up on the screen or maybe write it into the chat as well. There were a number of questions that we unfortunately did not have time um, to get to, but I hope that they can reach out and connect with you and discuss the questions that they have. So with that, it brings us to the end of our session. You know, Karina, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We are so incredibly grateful for your insights. To those of you watching from all over the world, I hope that you found this session as energizing and inspiring as I did, and that you can use some of these concepts as you accrue power and momentum for your own piece of the climate movement. Remember, these sessions have been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. So. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the forum. Yeah, thanks y'all, really appreciate the time and uh, do feel free to reach out if you have other questions, happy to follow up with folks um, or if you're interested in becoming a member of the lab. And thanks so much to the um, forum team for inviting me. This is really great. <laughs>